this stand up here so they know who's talking in case they watch the YouTube. Uh, Toby Terranova, I was secretary for the chapter. I'm a chaplain, I'm vice president of membership, I'm a videographer, and I'm also the webmaster. Here tonight to talk today to talk about spies in the sky. It's a big topic. I'm only going to go into the beginning history because it could take forever and get lost in all the technology about uh, how fine the cameras are and the resolutions and all that stuff, but I'm not going to get into it too technically. And the thing is, uh, I guess everyone here in this room is older than me, it looks that way. In my age, you're older. I'm 65, I'm 66. You all live through this program and you know what it is. And I didn't realize what it was, the first spy satellite program, until I started looking into this topic. And maybe Stu does because he said he downloaded some stuff on spy satellites. This morning. Okay. Hmm. Uh, so we're going to continue on and when you see what was the first spy satellite program, you say, oh yeah, I remember that. So let's go back in history. Okay. <clears throat> well, so what is a reconnaissance satellite or a spy satellite? It's basically any Earth observatory satellite, a communication satellite that's deployed for military and intelligence applications. Now on March 16th of 1955, the U.S. Air Force officially ordered the development of an advanced reconnaissance satellite. So this is the first, uh, first time a uh, U.S. agency was looking for an advanced reconnaissance satellite, and it was to provide continuous surveillance of pre-selected areas of the Earth. Why? In order to determine uh, the status of potential enemies' war-making capability. This was again in the middle of the Cold War. Obviously, you want to know what Russia and China was doing. Uh, as you'll see, you mentioned later on, we had problems with the U-2 program. It caused a little bit of a political embarrassment. And so uh, Eisenhower uh, was happy that uh, the Air Force was tasked with developing reconnaissance satellites. So the first generation of the Reconnaissance satellites were called Corona, and in Russia, or the, the Soviet Union, they were known as Zenit, that was their program, okay? And basically, they took photographs, and then they, interesting thing, they ejected their canisters of film, which were then retrieved in midair as they floated down on parachutes. Now, Bob and anybody else is going to be a pilot, is going to be pretty impressed with this, because I'll show you some video of this as well. This is an amazing thing that they've done with the with snatching this uh, cargo out of the air. Later on, of course, the satellites developed digital imaging systems and then they downloaded their images via encrypted radio links. But at the very beginning, the only thing they had was film and they had to get back to the Earth somehow for development and to, to look at it. And so they did it through uh, a parachute system. So there are a number of types of reconnaissance satellites that are dedicated to certain things. There's missile early, early warning systems they provide warning of an attack by detecting a ballistic missile, okay, as, it, as it's launched. And the, the first uh, missile system detection system we had was the missile, the missile Defense Alarm System, or MIDAS. They use the I in missile for the acronym, MIDAS system. Then, of course, there's nuclear explosion detection, something else that we're interested in, and that identifies and it characterizes nuclear explosions in space, okay. Again, concerned about the development of nuclear weapons in space, these satellites uh, can detect those nuclear explosions in space. And they were the VELA program. They use, they use video and, and shock waves and things like that, thermal imaging or something? The, the nuclear, uh, that I don't know, I didn't go into that. I only went into the photographic <coughs> okay. surveillance. Then, of course, there's the common ones that we think of as the photosurveillance. They provide imaging of the Earth from space. And the images can be a survey or they can be a close look of a telephoto, depends upon the satellite or if the camera is adjustable. And Corona is the earliest known uh, example of that type of reconnaissance satellite. And it basically does spectral imaging, which is commonplace. And again, light, light is just a certain uh, portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, above light waves and frequency is the ultraviolet light, and below light waves and uh, visible light and frequency is infrared. <coughs> infrared, you can detect warm bodies, you can detect uh, engines on vehicles, you can detect missile uh, exhausts, which are, really have a strong infrared signal. So uh, taking pictures is only one part of the electromagnetic spectrum that satellites will observe. Then there's electronic reconnaissance, which is basically signals intelligence. 
and they basically intercept stray radio waves. They can be communications, they could be radar systems, they can be um, guidance systems on missiles, all <coughs> kinds of uh, electronic intelligence that are important in order to counter, uh, use electronic countermeasures to uh, defeat either the radars or the missiles. How high do these satellites go? Uh, well, they would go from low Earth orbit, which is about 150 to 280 miles above the Earth, okay. to uh, geosynchronous, which is 22,500 or 700 miles above the Earth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so electronic the reconnaissance. The LEO, they're the ones that are Low Earth, Low Earth orbit. orbit. Okay, gotcha. Most, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then of course there's radar imaging, which is done. Again, radar is just a <coughs> you're into the radio wave, you're below the infrared and you're into the radio wave uh, spectrum radar. It's still a high frequency radio waves, but it's below the infrared and below visible. And most space-based radars use synthetic aperture radar. Uh, it's a particular type of radar that can look right through cloud cover. So with photo reconnaissance, you need uh, clear skies in order to see anything on the ground. With synthetic aperture radar, you can see right through the clouds because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't look at the uh, spectrum that the clouds uh, absorb. And the earliest known uh, reconnaissance satellites there were called the USA series. So now what are some of the missions? Again, just like the satellite designs, that's the type of mission they went to. There's high resolution photography, which is called IMINT. All right, and that's an intelligence gathering discipline which collects information via satellite and aerial photography. Then there's also measurement and signals and signature intelligence, which is called MASIM. That detects, tracks, and identifies or describes the signatures, let's say distinctive characteristics of a fixed or dynamic target sources. Again, these would be like your missiles launching off or something like that. Something that gives away the, what a target is, these satellites would measure and look for those signatures. Then there's communications eavesdropping, which is SIGNET, and that's basically intelligence derived from electronic signals and systems used by foreign targets, such as communication systems, radars, and weapon systems. So again, this would be for uh, developing a counterintelligent, counter, uh, counter electronic countermeasures for SAM missiles and things like this. There's also co covert communications. Obviously, the military wants to communicate worldwide, and they don't want uh, anyone to know what they're saying. So they have a whole satellite system that's uh, devoted just to uh, uh, global communications. Uh, also want to monitor nuclear test ban compliance. Uh, this was important, again, in the 60s and the 70s, and it still is today. I would imagine these type of satellites are detecting uh, Korea's uh, nuclear program and Iran's nuclear program. So that's how we know what Korea's doing, because we have these reconnaissance satellites up in space that are designed to look for different signatures and, and, and different electromagnetic spectrum uh, signs that say there's a nuclear activity going on. Go a rough ge general question, how many satellites are out there doing this and are they all geosynchronous or they're all, you know, just kind of okay. conceptually? Uh, this whole area is basically classified, okay. so nobody really knows. Okay. Um, the program I'm going to talk about today was declassified in 1995 under uh, uh, Bill Clinton's administration. <coughs> there was another program called Hexagon, which was declassified in 2011. That's a real interesting program too. Maybe I'll get a talk on that. But you know, there, there's from hundreds to thousands. It's, it's yeah. hard to tell. Yeah. There, I mean, there are like 10,000 plus objects in orbit around the planet. So today, who knows how much is really dedicated towards this type of military intelligence? Fair amount. Yeah. So a lot. Imagine. With covert yeah. communications, yeah. you still have to use some kind of. Radio wave, yeah. and microwaves, right. uh, communicate. And but also, if it's done but through satellite, you okay. it's kind of secure it's because you can't be to stopped, to right? Can't it from the right. And if you if you use uh, uh, beam technology so that you're focusing the, uh, oh. the, the signal, that wow. keeps the footprint narrow as well when it's coming down to the to the earth. So, so, so you can send stuff lasers. halfway around so the world. Some lasers now or something. I'm sure, right? Possibly. Yeah. Modulated the lasers. Lasers, yeah. probably. Yeah, exactly. The thing is, you know, if you had, if you if you did it over wires uh, across the ground, they could be intercepted anywhere. Suppose you want to communicate with Australia, twelve thousand miles, right? That can be intercepted anywhere. But if you have an uplink to a satellite system and then a downlink to Australia, only the up and downlinks can be intercepted. Mm. So you could watch them a lot easier than uh, the whole twelve thousand length, the mile length of uh, okay. cable for communication. 
And of course, then there's the detection of missile launches, which is extremely important to us. We want to know when North Korea is going to send a missile at us so we can uh, get our uh, anti-missile uh, systems uh, pointed in the right direction and ready to intercept it. Okay, so now, what are the benefits of eyes in the sky and all this spying that's going on? Uh, some of it is the commercial satellite imagery that's come from these, these projects. I mean, before um, the military spy satellites, there was really no photography of the Earth at such a distance. It was only through planes and maybe the U-2. Uh, so you, you got a broader picture of what was going on on Earth, and you could also get a very fine picture as well as the satellites got better. But there are companies like GOI and Digital Globe that provide commercial satellite imagery to uh, various companies. It, it's useful for disaster response. Uh, you can think of Hurricane Sandy. You can get pictures of what was, uh, what's being affected there. The hurricane down in uh, New Orleans. You know, again, all of these things, you get a big, broad overview of what's going on so you know what the perimeter of the problem is and where you can put station your, uh, your rescue and recovery uh, operations so that, that you don't get trapped in. There's also human rights enforcement, okay? Again, there was uh, something going on in Sudan at the time that this was written in South, South Sudan. Uh, how do they know that Saddam Hussein killed his people and how do they know that uh, some of these other uh, uh, terror, terrorist, uh, not terrorist, but uh, uh, dictators. You know, dictators, dictators, right, dictators uh, kill their people? Well, you can see them, them making mass graves. All of a sudden you see bulldozers. Yeah. All of a sudden you see a pit. And all of a sudden you see bodies in it, and then all of a sudden you see everything covered up. Well, then you know what went on. So, ISIS. Yeah, ISIS, same thing. So you know, you know what's going on uh, through these spy satellites because of uh, the intelligence that they can provide. And Jimmy Carter said that uh, these satellites were useful in stabilization of world affairs. He actually mentioned this during his 1980 State of the Union address when he explained how all of humanity benefited from the presence of American spy satellites. And this was his quote. He said, photo reconnaissance satellites, for example, are enormal, enormously important in stabilizing world affairs and thereby make a significant contribution to the security of all nations. Well, how do they stabilize world affairs? Well, you're kind of limited or hindered if you know somebody's watching you. If you know somebody's not watching you, you may do things that, uh, you know, you don't want people to know about. And so if there are satellites up there, you're careful about what you're doing, and you're careful about the treaties you make, and you're careful about the statements you make, because they can easily be proven false. Or do you run your dig big holes in the ground? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like the Iranians do, right? Like, yeah, exactly. OK. So on the benefits of military intelligence, that during the 1950s, there was a Soviet hoax that apparently led Americans to fear of a bomber gap. Okay. And you remember when uh, Kennedy was uh, running for the first time, John F. Kennedy, mm -hmm. in 1960, he was running on a missile gap. Missile gap, yeah. Right. So apparently before the missile gap became an issue, there was a bomber gap issue. I don't remember this, but I was, uh, I was born in 1950, so I don't remember much of it. But anyway, uh, in 1968, after gaining a lot of satellite photography, the United States intelligence agencies were able to state with certainty that no new ICBM complexes had been established in the USSR during the past year. Okay, and that was important to President Lyndon B. Johnson, and this is what he said in 1967 about that certainty. He said, I, would want to be I wouldn't want to be quoted on this, but we've spent 35 or 40 billion on the space program, and if nothing else had come out of it except the knowledge that we gained from space photography, it would be worth 10 times what the whole program had cost. Because tonight we know how many missiles the enemy has, and as it turned out, our guesses were way off. We were doing things we didn't need to do, we were building things we didn't need to build, and we were harboring fears we didn't need to harbor. So the military intelligence program has, uh, again, you could say this leads to world stabilization, because we're not that concerned about being as aggressive if we know that our enemy is not that aggressive. And by having this knowledge, we don't have to build thousands of rockets and warheads because we know what they've got. And we also know the capabilities of those rockets and warheads, so we know whether we're ahead of them technologically or we're not ahead of them technologically. Therefore, we can devote our research dollars to those areas where we think we're not ahead of them and catch up. 
Okay, here's a little movie. This guy is a little frenetic, but here's a little movie that kind of recaps the whole thing. Oh, we've got to start my speaker, or we're not going to hear anything. Space travel has taught us a lot about the universe. Over the years, we've sent people to the moon, built a handful of space stations and space telescopes, and sent spacecraft to explore all kinds of different worlds in our solar system. Not to mention the thousands of satellites orbiting Earth right now. But there's a side of space flight that we don't often hear about, probably because it's the sort of thing governments like to keep to themselves. Spy satellites. There's a lot of information that still isn't public, especially when it comes to the exact capabilities of today's oh. military satellites. But every so often, governments will declassify some part of their military satellite program's history, right. and right. we'll get to find out a little more about what's been going on behind the scenes. During the 1960s and 70s, for example, the U.S. spent a lot of time trying to make spy satellites practical. But it was hard, because the photos still had to be stored on film. So even if satellites took great pictures, how was the government supposed to get a hold of them? The U.S. government, at least, tried to solve this problem with early satellite systems like Corona, Gambit, and Hexagon. From 1960 to 1972, the Corona program launched over 140 bus-sized, cigar-shaped satellites into orbit, each equipped with one and later two huge wide-lens cameras, sometimes nearly three meters long. The tubes were also stuffed with thousands of meters of specially modified film. The satellites passed over enemy targets, mostly the USSR, several times a day usually taking between a day and a week to use up all their film. Then came the hard part, getting the photos back. Spent film was held in one or more special <coughs> capsules, or film buckets, and eventually the satellite would drop that bucket, which would start plummeting toward Earth in a controlled fall. Once it re-entered Earth's atmosphere and hit a safe height of about 18 kilometers, the bucket's heat shield would pop off and its parachutes would drop. Now, here comes the best part. Because no one wants a pile of super-secret spy photos crashing into a random picnic, drops usually occurred off the coast of Hawaii, where a plane would be waiting to snag the package mid-air with a sort of dangling claw. Special crews spent months practicing these complicated retrievals, though they still sometimes missed, because it turns out it's hard Hard to catch a falling bucket in a sling. The film they did manage to catch was then meticulously examined by dozens of microscope-wielding analysts. And even though the resolution was nowhere near as good as it is today, experts could still gather tactical information, compare new images with older ones, and learn more about the landscape. We don't have access to quite as much information when it comes to today's intelligence satellites, but they probably collect similar kinds of information, just a lot more of it. The technology behind digital imaging and wireless communication has improved a lot since the 60s and 70s. So, getting high-resolution photos from today's satellites is much simpler. I mean, you get a pretty good satellite view almost anywhere in the world just using Google Earth. So, if commercial images have resolution that high, could a spy satellite figure out what book you're reading in your backyard? Well, probably not, because we just haven't been able to build satellites with good enough cameras. The Federation of American Scientists estimates that at a one-meter resolution, meaning each pixel covers one square meter of ground, you'd be able to recognize a vehicle as a vehicle, and not a shed or a tree or whatever. A 50 centimeter resolution would give you a decent chance of identifying that car as a minivan. Well, at 25 centimeters, the highest resolution allowed by the U.S. government for commercial satellites, you might be able to recognize its make and model. With a 10 centimeter resolution, you'd probably be able to get an actual description of the van, or see if it had a roof rack, but you probably still couldn't read the license plate or make out the Buffy bobblehead on the dashboard. Whether we actually have the technology to take photos with a resolution of 10 centimeters is a separate question. There's some speculation that military and intelligence satellites may be getting photos with a resolution of 15 centimeters or better, but we don't know for sure, because that stuff's all classified. But we do know that one of the biggest challenges when it comes to analyzing satellite imagery is actually processing all that data. Back in the corona days, there weren't that many photos, so humans were able to carefully sift through them all. Now, there's way too much data for humans to process everything by hand, and computer software isn't that great at recognizing small objects in photos, or knowing when a change in landscape might be important. But at least we aren't swiping buckets out of the sky anymore. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow Space, and thanks especially to our patrons on Patreon who help make this show possible. So what okay. do you think at 10 centimeters? I, well, I think they've got better than that. No. And the reason I think that is I'm an amateur astronomer. And, I know no, they, they, and they have adaptive optics. Here.
right? Yeah. yeah. You're familiar with adaptive optics, where they actually can deflect and bend the mirrors. Mm -hmm. and they have make little hexagon type mirrors, and they can yeah. so that it removes the, the, the shimmer of the atmosphere from the yeah. from the photo. And at this point, we have ground-based <laughs> telescopes that are actually better than the Hubble because of adaptive optics. <laughs> so you can do this in reverse. You can have an adaptive optics system sure. in space. No, and take this. I would think if without adaptive optics you were getting 10, 15 yeah. centimeters with it, you could probably get yeah. only a few. Yeah. 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 yeah, I know. I'll have to talk to you later on about it. <laughs> but, uh, so, I mean, it's my guess. I have no idea. Nobody has any idea because, again, it's all classified. But with adaptive optics, they can really get a, they can eliminate the, the problem with the, the, the shimmer in the atmosphere. Or the light. Yeah, to sharpen up. Yeah. The sharpen up the image that uh, you know nowadays too they can have these uh, kind of like adaptive optic but like part of the telescope is in Australia part of it's here in the United States part of it's in Germany and they take all those signals at one time combine and them and they get it right combine them together and they get a higher resolution signal yeah, yeah. so that's in a sense the entire Earth is the, is the, is the is telescope the, is the telescope yeah exactly. okay. So now we're going to get into the history of how it all started. And it all started with the Western Development Division. Anybody ever hear of the Western Development Division? This no. was Division of the Air Force. Okay. So on July 1, 1954, the Air Force established the Western Development Division. And they were the Air Research and Development Command, ARDC, under the direction of then Brigadier General Bernard Schreiber. So what was the Western Development Division responsible for? Developing the nation's first intercontinental ballistic missile. And that was the Atlas. We're all familiar with that. And as an alternative or a backup, they were developing the Titan. So they had two missiles that they were developing in parallel. They were, Atlas was the primary, but in case Atlas failed, they'd have the Titan. Turned out both worked pretty well, which was good. Now on October 10th, 1955, the ARDC transferred the first Air Force Space Development Program, known as WS-117L, from Wright Air Development Center to the Western Development Division. So, Jack, you were out at, uh, at Wright. Right past, yeah. yeah, exactly. But you were there in the 60s, so this is 60, about 10, yeah. years, 10 years earlier. Right. Yeah. And by the end of 55, the division was given the additional task of developing an intermediate range ballistic, intermediate range ballistic missile called the Thor. Okay, and we'll find out that the Thor was really the one that they used to, to uh, send up the spy satellites, the Atlas and the, the Titan. The guided missiles? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and you. I was surprised, I'll show you a graphic a little later on, about how they can move, maneuver the missile, in the, yeah. the, the satellite in space. It's really impressive. I didn't think they had the technology back then. Okay. By, by June 1, 1957, the Western Development Division was rede redesignated as the Air Force Ballistic Missile Division. Again, the concentration was on ballistic missiles. And of course, you need to have a, a reliable ballistic missile in order to get a satellite in orbit. So that's, that's why they started off with that. September 20, 1957, the first successful Thor intermediate range ballistic missile was launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida. Okay. Then in December of that year, the 54th anniversary of the Wright Brothers flight, the first successful Atlas launch uh, occurred and a short range flight was made. So the Atlas, which was their main goal, uh, was working. By is a ballistic Christmas. missile a guided missile? Yeah. It is. Okay. Well, it's, it can be. Can, it can be. be. It's, it's guided to a point in space, and then it's on its own. Okay. It's right. it take you know, ballistic. It's you know. It's put on the trajectory. Rather, you know, yeah. Yeah. What's it mean? Put on the trajectory, but, yeah. but, but it's guided into that trajectory. It, it, it's a combination. Of, a bullet is a ballistic, totally ballistic. Right. Okay. These <coughs> missiles are not once it's in the air, no control. Right. Well, once it gets into space, it's. And, and, and you've got thrusters are, are used, then at that point it becomes ballistic. Okay, while it's going into space, while it's coming off the pad, while it's got engine fuel, okay. uh, you okay. know, it can be controlled with fins and, and put into a certain <laughs> orbit. The thrusters are going, that's right. not missile right. or guided. Okay, right. gotcha. So once that's gone, but then of course they do have thrusters on the satellites, which fine tune it as well. Right. Oh yeah, right. Sure. Okay, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. All right, so then, let's see, the Soviet Union, back in uh, 1957, we all remember this, launched their Sputnik Earth Orbit Satellite on October 4th, 1957. 
And that really shook everybody up, especially mm -hmm. here in the United States, because we thought we were going to get bombs from the sky dropped on top of us. Okay? People began building bomb shelters and storing food and the whole thing. You know, it, it was difficult for them to fly bombers over here with nuclear bombs, and they had some ICBMs, but when they put something overhead, you didn't know what to expect to rain down upon you. So, and this is another good reason for having satellites that detect nuclear weapons in space, uh, to make sure that space is not being weaponized. How much should that, the word nuclear, like if I use the word nuclear in a sentence, everybody goes, ah! You know, how much of that was encouraged by the military to, to encourage, encourage well, that fear? the military, the, the media, system. you know, everyone was making money on it if you're in the media. The more you scared people, the more they watch the program. So, it depends. Okay. It sold books, it sold newspapers. Uh, it's still true today. It's you like terrorism today. You exactly. can't say the word today, and people are like, Ugh. Well. Like terrorism today, the chances of you being encountering a terrorist like being struck by lightning, right. yet everybody feels that tomorrow they could, they could run into a terrorist and be dead. But that's not the case. Right. Okay. But that's the way the news media makes you feel. From 1945 to about 1955, right. this whole country was full of uh, building you know, fence plans. Schools were given water buckets and stuff like right. that. Right. You know, they were going to have some drills, duck and cover. And, Right. That was for about 10 years worth. Right, because uh, when, the, uh, when, the, uh, when did the Russians explode their atomic bomb? Right, 1950, 51? Oh, around there. And then the hydrogen bomb, 48, they had in like 48? 48. 48? Okay, 48. right. And then and they, they had, had the hydrogen bomb around... around 49. And the hydrogen bomb, I think they had around 55 or something like that. But well, there were civil defense drills and all that kind of right. stuff. Right. Okay. All right, let's continue on. So Sputnik's impact was immediately given the impetus to the Air Force missile program, obviously. Uh, and it's emerging space projects. But it, it was, everything was on an emergency basis. They lifted restrictions. They threw money at it, and uh, you know the whole program just blossomed at that point. Uh, so the Western Development Division is currently called the Space and Missile Systems Center, and that's out at Los Angeles Air Force Base. Now, has anybody ever heard of Los Angeles Air Force Base? Well, you have. Air Force Station. Well. Okay. Uh, how many runways and how many planes does it have? Any idea? None. None. You're exactly none. right. Yeah. It's got none. It's all this building. It's all. So you've yeah. been there. Okay. So this is exact, exactly what we're talking about. Josh has been there. Uh, it's, I've never heard of it. I was in Los Angeles for eight years. Uh, and it's technically not in Los Angeles. It's in El Segundo, which is uh, just south of Los Angeles Airport. But um, its name was the Air Force Ballistic Missile Division. In 67, it was changed to the Space and Missile Systems Organization. 79, the name was changed again to the Space Systems Division. And in 1992, it's been called the Space and Missile Systems Center. Not too much different from the 67 name, just organization to center. In some ways, it reflects what it does. It does more than missiles. It also does space technology. How many here have seen a Sputnik go I've seen the satellites pass over, satellites, yeah. the not the Sputnik. Yeah, actually saw them. Yeah. yeah. Only one, two. What, what, what do you mean, a satellite go satellite yeah. overhead? Yeah, yeah. Sputnik. Sputnik. A little yeah. spot. A little yeah. tiny spot. spot. I've ever seen a Sputnik. I think, uh, I think before we launched our uh, Arctic like a satellite, firefly. We had, do you remember the ECHO program? Mm -hmm. It was a big uh, aluminized yeah. balloon that they yeah. reflected yeah. radio transmissions on. Yeah. I saw that once. My uncle, uh, he pointed it out to me in the sky as he was going over. So I, I saw the echo way back in 58, 59. I was a little kid at the time. The best one but to look at now is probably the space station. What? Yeah, that's what it. What do you mean? The echo. The echo was a was a was a very large aluminized balloon. It was, oh, 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 oh. Um, and they used it just to reflect radio waves off of. <clears throat> they were they were studying the propagation of radio waves into space and back. Right. Okay, and so they 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 sent up. This is before our, our satellites, I believe. So they sent this big, I forget how large it was, uh, 50 feet or something like that, and it was all aluminized. Mm -hmm. So as you got towards dusk, and the sun was still shining in the upper atmosphere, but it was dark where you were, it could stand up, stood out like a point of light. And it was like a big, not a big, it was like a, a point of bright light, like a star. But you could see it moving and moving and moving in one direction. And so that was the ECHO program. Uh, today you can see the International Space Station like that. You can watch it move. Uh, there are communication satellites, I think the military satellites, I'm not sure, are called Iridium. And they're in orbits that are uh, low Earth orbit as well. You can see them pass over every now and then. And there are uh, websites 
that have the trajectory of all of these satellites and they'll tell you when they're going to be passing over in your area, between what time and exactly where in the sky they'll be, so you can go out there and look at them at, the, yeah, at space, a good time. Spaceflybys.com? Yep, stuff like that. Yeah, who needs spies anymore? Well, you can find it on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, stuff that's on the internet is the, is the trivial stuff that's, you know, really first grade. The good stuff is, is uh, secret. Can you imagine uh, World War II? Uh, you wanted to send a message. You're, you're a thousand miles away from the home base. Right. And you told the radio operator, send a message that we're coming up on our, our uh, point of uh, rendezvous. Okay. Maybe half an hour go by and said, I finally got through the base. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Now it's instantaneous. Yeah. Yeah. Are you sure that's changed? Um, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm not so sure. I know when 9 11 happened, the uh, firefighters and the oh, cops so had trouble communicating with each other. Yeah, but that, that's that's a civil organization, civil emergency organization. Yeah. We're talking military. Yeah. That's a different story. Okay. They, 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 uh, how about the uh, colonel from Vermont National Guard flying some combat air patrol over New York in the afternoon? Unknown plane come up the coast. He's ordered in to follow it, see what it was, couldn't identify it. Right. So it was going to Kennedy, they said, fine, let it land, don't let it get to downtown New York. Right. right. It turned it did land, it turned out it was a bunch of FEMA officials. Oh really? Yeah. FEMA were coming in for the because one of them had decided, yeah. let's take a circle around before we land. Oh, oh, this is the guy who had to shut them down. Who did you say it was on the right? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, they what happened was the FAA got the civilian planes on the ground and they went home. Right. So there was no communi real communication between civilian and military traffic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was supposed to be, it wasn't. Okay. Let me see what happens. All right, so the Space and Missile Systems Center is in Los Angeles Air Force Base that I talked about. And uh, it's basically an acquisition center for excellence in acquiring, developing, and sustaining military space systems. So I believe today it's still uh, in this business as well, and it's the foremost place for it. Its portfolio in the past included the global positioning system. We're all familiar with that. I got here today by GPS in my car. Uh, military satellite communications, of course. Uh, defense meteorological satellites. You know, so there are a lot of uh, weather satellites up there in space that are uh, you know, looking and, and giving the military uh, Weather information, they don't exactly go out to Weatherbug or Weather.com or anything like that. They have their own, uh, their own equipment. And it's also into <coughs> space launch and range systems. I would imagine space launch might include Vandenberg, because Vandenberg is north of uh, Los Angeles. And a lot of these satellites are shot up from Vandenberg. It also is involved with the satellite control networks. And uh, those would be networks on the ground that are receiving satellite information, like. Uh, who was saying earlier about being an Australian? Oh, yeah, well, Stu, again. Uh, um, Jack, I mean. Uh, I was the Australian. He's the Australian. Right, you asked about Australia, right. but I'm right. saying, yeah. yeah. He's getting information through, through uh, uh, satellite control networks that was all coming down from that. Space-based infrared systems, of course, they're still looking at to uh, detect missiles and uh, vehicles and whatever, and space situational awareness capabilities just to uh, be monitoring what's going on in space and what other countries are doing up there with their satellites as well. How many thousands or how many satellites do they estimate are in orbit? Uh, I don't, well, there's about 10,000 <coughs> 10, plus objects, I believe, yeah. Uh, how many are useful? Right, they're all being tracked all by, uh, by NORAD or whatever. Uh, how many are dead, how many are alive, and what their purpose is is unclear. But there's 10,000. It's uh, if you've ever seen, they have graphics with all of the satellites uh, as points around the Earth. It's just amazing. The whole Earth is covered just completely. When does the sun get through? It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not that bad, but yeah, that's, that's why every once in a while on the picture it looks that way. People see these flaming things coming. Right, it's just a lot of dead satellite lights. Right. Right. right, right, exactly, and. I was thinking also, you know, um, again, you were involved with uh, Project Blue Book a little bit? No, I wasn't involved. No, but, uh, oh. It was there. It was there. You weren't involved. Okay. Uh, but, you know, they were dropping these film canisters. And suppose the film canister didn't come down in the right orbit. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, maybe it landed in Pennsylvania, and that's what the people in Pennsylvania, and all of a sudden the military comes around, yeah, right. and, you know, and they're wondering, what's going on? Oh, it's people from outer space. No, it isn't. They're picking up film canisters. They don't want anybody to get to it. They don't want anybody to see the technology. <laughs> yeah. On, on the film canister business, once they right. use up the film, the satellites jump. Right. 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 Okay, so mm. the film, it, it's, they were saying, like, in um, that video, like, every day or week or month you use up the film yep so you need a satellite one satellite per month yep. maybe yep. one satellite a, a, per, a per day, day when they first started per day. Day. <laughs> a day's worth right so that's why there were 149 uh, satellites put up 38 in the discover program um in another film I, another video i've got at the end it talks about the film the development the advancements they made they they put a photosensitive okay. layer onto a polymer Okay, and they made the polymer layer very thin, so it wasn't a, a cellulose acetate type of thing. Okay, they make the polymer layer very thin, and they had I don't know, like 31,000 feet of film in one satellite, and it could last like more than a week. So there's a lot of lot of advantage. We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so weapon system 117L. That was the beginning of the military satellite system. Again, in February 1956, started out the Western Development Division. Uh, but by 1959, the program got so big that they really, had to, they really had to break it up into three different programs because there are three different aspects of uh, space intelligence that, they, in, intelligence that they wanted from space. Okay, so what was MILSAT became the Discover program, which that's the program everyone should be familiar with. I mean, that was done in the 1950s. That was our answer to Sputnik. Um, uh, also, the military observation system, satellite and military observation system, SAMOS, and the military detection alarm system, which was MIDAS. Okay. Now, Discover and SAMOS were to carry out photo reconnaissance, and MIDAS was to carry out missile warning. So you can see all of this was watching what's on the ground, watching what's coming out towards us, and then watching what's in space possibly coming down at us. So I'm just going to concentrate on the Discover program because just this program alone can fill up a talk. And it was basically developed as a film return photo reconnaissance satellite. Right? So it carried a camera that took pictures from space as it passed over the Sino-Soviet bloc. That was the main interest. Uh, the film was deorbited in a capsule and a parachute slowed its descent. And then it was recovered either in midair or in the ocean. It was recovered in midair by an airplane or in the ocean by uh, a ship coming along or a helicopter coming along and scooping it up. Stupid question. Yeah. Uh, normal yeah. re-entry space, manned spacecraft, they got heat shields and all this stuff. It did. It, it did. did. Yes. Okay. This technology is amazing. It, it sounds phenomenal. Yes. There were no radio signals so that the Russians didn't know. That's another thing. This is all, you know, we'll get into it, it was all visual acquisition when the, there were two pilots on the plane and they were, you know, We'll get into it a little later on. Let's see, but okay. So here, here is basically what the Corona system looked like, or the early uh, Discoverer systems. Here's the size of a man, so you can see that they're about eh, 12 to 15 feet long. They had, uh, you know, the liquid fuel in here for the engine, and that's a top view, and this is a side view. Uh, it's a front view. Uh, so they were about the size of eh, 12 feet, 14 feet, size of a small bus, and the weight of a small bus. They're about 2,000 pounds. Here's a little more detail. Uh, you can't, unfortunately, you can't read this stuff here. But uh, the uh, this is right in here is the uh, photographic canister. Uh, I guess there was a system of optical uh, lenses or mirrors that would then focus the light. There would be a, a focal point here, looking at the ground, and then it would be uh, bent and expose the film that was inside this canister, which is the one that would eventually fall back to the earth. They show how they had multiple cameras, so they could they could take somewhat of a stereoscopic view of what was going on to get some idea of, uh, of height. And so the photo reconnaissance mission was not revealed to the public. Nobody knew that. We were told it was uh, an experimental program to develop and test satellite subsystems and explore environmental conditions in space. Now that was a time when the government couldn't lie to the uh, the intelligence agencies couldn't lie to the. American public. I think now they passed a law that says they can. But anyway, so this was the truth because some of the missions did carry experimental payloads instead of or in addition to their normal reconnaissance payloads. So they only told us part of the story. 
Now, on some of the missions, mission three carried some biological experiments. So again, it was the uh, influence of space on, on life. Uh, mission two some, carried some simulated experiments. I'm not sure what they mean by simulated. I couldn't find out much about that, but uh, I guess they, maybe they were uh, just to see, because since this is mission two, just to see if it could lift the payload. Uh, but both are lost in launch failures, so two and three were, were not too useful. Missions 19, 21, 49, 52, 57, 73, 92, and 99. And this goes beyond, once you go beyond 38, you're, this is the whole Corona program, but the Discoverer program stops at 38. Anyway, these missions gathered infrared background data for the MIDAS program, which was the Missile Defense System program. And other, other missions carried geodetic payloads that were accurately determining latitude and longitude and altitude of uh, various places on the Earth. So the Discoverer program carried about 38 launches and achieved a lot of breakthroughs. Here were some of the first. Discoverer 1, which was, went up in February of 59, was the world's first polar orbiting satellite. So that's kind of interesting. We went to polar orbit, but you had to do that for surveillance if you wanted to, if you wanted to uh, get good surveillance of the Soviet Union. Discoverer 2, in April of 59, was the first satellite to be stabilized in orbit in all three axes. Uh, I think uh, some of the satellites like the Vanguard or the earlier ones, they had them spin, so gyroscopically they would be stabilized by their own mass because they would be rotating. But now you can't do that with a photographic satellite. You could do that with a, maybe a uh, radio communications satellite, but you can't do it with a photographic satellite. So it's got to be stabilized in all three axes, so that, and it's got to be well stabilized so you can take a clear picture. So. By 1959, when you think about how early in the, era, in the arena of uh, missiles and launching this was, by 1959, they had the ability to stabilize in orbit, uh, satellite in orbit in all three axes. And it maneuvered on command from the Earth. Now that's interesting, too. In 59, they could actually have the satellite uh, maneuver in orbit. We always thought, or I always thought of these things as kind of like dead objects. Uh, again, we're talking about ballistics. Once they got up there, it was in a ballistic situation, and uh, it just stayed in a circular orbit and didn't, uh, didn't move around. But they could actually command from the Earth to get it to maneuver. Also in Discover 2, they, they got, a, got it to separate a re-entry vehicle on command. That would have been the canister that would bring the film back down and to send the re-entry re vehicle back to Earth. So not only did it separate, I guess they had a few that separated, but never made it back to Earth. It separated and it made it back to Earth. So it demonstrated the ability, by Discoverer 2, it demonstrated the ability to carry out the mission. Although it took to Discoverer 14 before it was actually successful. Discoverer 13 in August of 1960. So you see between 59 and 60, they lost about 13 of these, these missiles. Again, they were out at, I uh, believe Vandenberg is where they launched these from. But in August of 1960, they ejected a capsule that was recovered in the Pacific Ocean. And this was the first successful recovery of a man-made object ejected from an orbiting satellite. So that was kind of interesting. And then Discover 14, August 1960, again, you can see that these are shot up in the same month. They ejected a capsule which was recovered in mid-air, northwest of Hawaii, by a C-119J aircraft. And this was the first successful aerial recovery of an object returned from orbit. And the capsule of Discover 14 was the first to return film from orbit inaugurating the age of satellite reconnaissance. So in August 1960, we had a system developed, the Air Force had a system developed that was successful in returning uh, film reconnaissance photographs. And if you remember, it was around 1960 that uh, Francis Gary Powers was shot down, I think, yeah. in, in Russia. So uh, I think I've got a slide that says later on, this happened like three months after Francis Gary Powers was shot down. So Discover 17, 18, 25, 26, 29, 30, 31, 32, 35, and 36, and 38, all returned films and film capsules, and they were successfully recovered. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 out of 38 missions that were, uh, that did the job. And from four, when you consider from 14 on, up to 14 was really development of the system. So from 14 on to 38, you had 20, 24, I guess. So you had 11 out of 24, so about a 50% success rate. All right, so satellite reconnaissance. Okay, here, fill the crucial need because President Eisenhower had suspended aerial reconnaissance of the Soviet Union just three months earlier after the Soviets had shot down the U-2 spy plane piloted by Francis Gary Powers. 
and we had another U-2 shot down in uh, Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So uh, U-2s were vulnerable. The Russians could uh, lock on with radar and shoot them down with SAM missiles. And so it's a good thing we had the satellite program ready. So the satellite program, the Discoverer program, was officially ended after the launch of Discoverer 38 in February of 1962. But it really continued until 1972 under the secret code name of Corona. That's the name which Discoverer is known by an intelligence community. Discoverer 1 was Corona 1, etc. Uh, Question. Yeah. When did the SR-71 Blackbird come out? And was that to cover areas more efficiently and cheaply than 500 million satellites? Well, I did, I did a talk on uh, uh, unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles as well, as well. And there was a contest between piloted vehicles, unmanned aerial vehicles, and satellites as to which could do what. And there, was, uh, there were times when the, well, the piloted vehicles were the best early before the satellites. Uh, then they started developing uh, drones with cameras, and they used the exact same system. They would have the unmanned aerial vehicle fly over a target area, come around and drop the canister of film for recovery. Lots of times, and that was dropped at Earth to, to, to land. Lots of times they couldn't get to that film. Uh, they lost track of it, okay. But uh, it's, it's hard to say. Throughout time, things change. Well, it was I'm, all kind of integrated. All, it's, yes. it's, it's, uh, this it was is a competition. Yeah. There was, it was a, a three-way competition. Uh, obviously, you don't want to put men in a situation where it's going to be dangerous. Uh, you want to try and fly a <laughs> unmanned aerial vehicle. Um, if you want wide area reconnaissance, you want a satellite because an unmanned area vehicle is going to be low to the ground. Lots of times you want to keep it under radar. You know, it depends. So, depending upon the mission, uh, was the vehicle you chose, and they they developed all three systems. That's what I'm saying. It's our 71. It couldn't be shot down though, right? It was going so fast. Uh, or or high, yeah. High, uh, yeah. Again, high and fast. Yeah, <laughs> and I think I'm not sure if it was. Uh, because the one the one man version was called the ox cart. And I think it was around in the sixties, late sixties, early seventies. And the, the Blackbird came out in the seventies, uh, and that was the two man vision, uh, version. And I guess they had a two man version because one pilot could sleep while the other one was was, was uh, taking care of systems and all of that. You know. Right. Time line when they started getting satellites that would get mapped here in the car and in our pocket. That was later. Yeah, that was uh, in the, I think, 1980s, they developed the yeah. GPS system. Is it an outcome of this? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and the same uh, Los Angeles Air Force Base, the same system, system, missile and systems uh, center is uh, developed that. So. In the integrated circuit. All of this technology came out of Southern California, basically. Late the fifties was an integrated circuit started in the late. 50s. Yep. The transistor was invented in yeah, uh, 40, 47. 47. 47. Yeah. Right. Right. The integrated circuit was uh, that old, was for the Apollo program. I thought there were no. There were earlier than fifty eight. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if they used them for this. So I'm pretty sure the SR the two man crew because they needed them for the work to be done. Yes. Well, that's possible too. They don't no, have range, they don't have yeah. range to, to need some of the well, <coughs> It depends. They could get aerial refuel. I, I think they could aerial refuel. Like, yeah, they refueled in the air. They wow. could? Oh, yes. That's the all. Yeah, they consumed incredible quantities of rare fuels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Russians have a the comparable Russians. program going on. Um, Again, it's hard to say, but we can't even tell what our program is. Yeah. Well, yeah, right. the Russian program is, is a secret, but um, I think we feel that we're ahead of the Russians. Uh, what it actually is, I'm not sure. Um, they Now, I entitled this Spies in the Sky because I didn't want to entitle it Reconnaissance Satellites, because I may talk about in a, in a, in a future time. We, they, we were planning the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, MOL, MOL back in the 1950s. Okay. Wow. And when I gave my talk on the uh, X-31B, the, the uh, autonomous shuttle, mini, mini shuttle that we have now going up in space, there was a program called Dinosaur uh, that was going on. And that would allow one man to be shot into orbit in a rocket, basically. And he had a, an airplane type uh, vehicle that could then re-enter and come back down. And he could take reconnaissance pictures and do other things. 
then they planned beyond that when that started, if that was working, they were going to do the manned orbiting laboratory, which was to have something like what we have now, the International Space Station, in orbit with men in it, basically doing reconnaissance photography and sending the pictures back down to Earth. And the reason they wanted men there was because you could, uh, you could have a longer mission, carry more, more film, you could send more information down, <coughs> and you could change your objectives really quickly. You could tell a man, oh, let's look at this, oh, what's that down there, point the camera in that direction. A satellite only had a limited amount of fuel that it could maneuver to look in different directions, so uh, a manned system would have been better. We, uh, NASA was created, and a lot of, and this is all Air Force projects. NASA was created, and that was all moved over to NASA because, um, I, I forget who was in charge, thought that NASA could handle it better, all right? Uh, but the Russians actually did develop a manned orbiting laboratory where they had people up in space doing reconnaissance photographs. But the thing is, satellite technology got so good that it didn't make sense to put people right. in space. Okay, because you could get the sharp pictures, you could get control of the satellite, and so, in a sense, it was good that we stopped the program because we didn't spend money on something that was soon uh, displaced by newer technology. So that's the answer there. The Russians, the Russians parallel, you know, back in the 50s and the 60s, I guess they had their informants everywhere. I mean, they had them on the atomic bomb project and the hydrogen bomb project. And, you know, they're not necessarily Russian citizens, they're Americans who are looking for money, unfortunately. And so somehow they know what we're doing, and somehow we know what they're doing. So it's, it's a double-edged sword. If I yeah. One other quick thing. What you just said, we know, they know what everybody's right. doing. If one of the purposes of the satellites is to detect a missile launch, and if there's right. 10,000 objects up there, there's a lot of missile launches, and somehow they got to right. tell us, and we got to tell them, hey, we're not attacking you, we're launching a spy satellite. I assume that goes on? Otherwise, I guess a lot of that can be determined by the trajectory of the missile itself. You can tell the type of orbit it's going into, where it's going to be going to, just like when North Korea shoots one, they know exactly where it's going to land. Yeah, yeah but it would be nice to have no, no five days ahead of time rather than have five I minutes think, to no, decide. I think they do. I think they do inform each other you know, yeah. on certain things. Certain Other military, right. they don't say anything. You know. I mean, when we shoot up the X thirty seven B, we announce. Why don't we announce it after it's launched? Now they come to think of it, because I guess we don't want anyone to. Uh, it's just a curious. Yeah, you know, yeah. You're, you're, that's a whole. Uh, it's a dance right. of the devil here. You yeah, know. exactly. In that interval you've got here, that ten-year interval, all of those things, a lot of that stuff was uh, launched out of uh, missiles, that kind of thing that were all made out of aluminum. Okay. And to, you had to weld that aluminum with heavy welding. Uh -huh. Okay. And I worked with Lindy down in Newark Labrador. We had a, a whole bunch of welding stuff that was called Missile Maker. Oh, there you where go. Where it was automatic welding of aluminum uh, and it was for building those rockets down in, in Georgia. Okay, yep. And there was a whole, a lot of that stuff could, wouldn't have been in orbit without that stuff that was done here in Newark. Hmm. Now, be, be, besides the Air Force having, you know, competing programs like the Atlas and the Titan, but you couldn't Actually, read it. Actually, the Navy, the Navy had a uh, program, Vanguard, where the satellites that came out of the Navy program, they were mainly dedicated towards uh, communications. Uh, the Army also had a program, and Werner von Braun was involved in the Army program, because I wondered where he fit in, because he was already here. Uh, so he was working on the Army program, he was not part of the Air Force program. But so you had the three, three basic military uh, branches working all in the same thing again in a competitive situation and within the branches you have competition as well. So yeah, but Airco and Lindy here in, in New Jersey were the ones that provided most of the welding activity. Okay. Do you know was any particular any branch? Uh, Navy, Air Force? No, all or, of it. All of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They had the, they had the welding yeah. system to weld aluminum. Yeah. Yeah. Where is it? In Newark? In Newark and in Murray Hill. That was where the laboratories were. <coughs> The factories were all over the country. But they called this stuff missile makers. Hmm. Okay, so Discoverer slash Corona, because it was really the Corona program, but this was the this is the civilian name, this was the uh, the intelligence name of the program. Its first major accomplishment was to provide photos of Soviet missile launch complexes. Okay. And that's exactly what we were looking for. It's why we had U two flyovers, only this time we were doing it from satellite. 
It identified the Pilets missile test range north of Moscow and provided information as to what missiles were being developed, tested, and deployed. All of that through photography. Now here's a case where world stabilization would, uh, would be coming into play. If the Russians knew that we were doing this, they would have to do it underground, like Howard says, and it would be much more difficult and costly for them to develop. They'd think twice about well, how much it's going to cost to develop this. Maybe modify programs or drop programs as opposed to having a lot of programs. So these and other accomplishments were revealed when the Corona program was declassified in February of 1995. Again, that was under uh, President Bill Clinton who was declassified. So I'm going to show you a little bit of mid-air retrieval. From a pilot's point of view, this is really a, a, an interesting thing. Basically, mid-air retrieval is a technique used in atmospheric reentry where the space vehicle, in our case we're thinking about the film canister, is slowed by parachutes and captured in mid-air by a specially equipped aircraft. Is that the one with the big fork in the front? In the back. In the back. Oh, no, no. This, this, had, this is going to have an aluminum loop, uh, oh, yeah. a nylon loop in the back. There was, the one that, there was one that had a big fork, fork in the front. In the front. And yeah, apparent, yeah, apparently if you missed, I guess it would crash into your uh, your, vis your, your windshield. <laughs> so, catching it, having trying to catch it below the plane and towards the back is probably a better idea. <laughs> yeah, it's possible, but uh, I wouldn't want to fly. I wouldn't want to try to catch something in front of me. I don't mind catching it behind me and below me because if I miss, it's going to keep going. In front of me, if I miss, I don't know where it's going to hit. So. What was the success rate? Uh, I'm not sure, but again, I've got some some a video on this. Okay. So now here are some of the criteria that you have to really think about when you're doing a, a successful mid-air retrieval. It obviously requires correct, correct operation of the retrieving aircraft, that would be the airplane, favorable atmospheric conditions, since they were doing this all by visual acquisition, you know, if you had fog or if it was rain or if you had heavy winds, uh, this would be problems. So you need proper atmospheric, favorable air, atmospheric conditions and successful execution of a tricky maneuver, which would be actually catching the thing. In addition to correct operation of the space vehicle itself, you had to know that the space vehicle was coming down in a predictable orbit and wasn't uh, spinning out of control and you know, wobbling and etc. So that was something that you could catch. The parachute had deployed so you could catch it. All right. So the first successful mission used the mid-air recovery was on August 19th, 1960 and a C-119 recovered film from the Corona mission, codenamed Discover 14. So that we talked about, that was the first successful film recovery uh, from space. And the C-119 was used to do that. A film from an orbiting satellite and the first aerial recovery of an object returned from Earth orbit. The early 1960s era Corona reconnaissance satellites returned delicate film capsules to the Earth. And for some reason, I'm not sure why they were delicate, but they required, required mid-air retrieval by JC-130 Hercules and an HC-130 airlifter. And what and why, I'm not sure about that statement. So, I mean, I have a few questions about my own, my own presentation. But. <laughs> the aircraft, now here, the aircraft were manned by a crew of 10 people. This was the catch plane. Two of them were pilots. One was a flight engineer. Two of them were telemetry operators. One was a winch operator. And four were riggers. Okay. So the telemetry operators acquired the satellite's location and relayed that information to the pilots. So they must have had some kind of uh, position in the aircraft where they could scan the skies and, and find the visually find it with binoculars or whatever ahead of time. Because they didn't use radar or anything. It was all visual acquisition. Once visually acquired, it was usually around 50,000 feet, the pilots would then head on a course to the satellite, descending towards the Pacific, the satellite was descending towards the Pacific Ocean. So the whole snatching operation was done visually by the pilots. And the winch operator and the four riggers would deploy the nylon rope loop with hooks. So apparently this, this rope, not only was just a rope, but it had hooks. I guess it could snag either the parachute lines or the parachute uh, silk, uh, depending upon uh, how it grabbed it. But once the contact was made between the parachute and the loop, the winch line would be paid out and eventually stop to uh, Again, it's like uh, fighting a, uh, a big fish out in the ocean. You've got to let it pull out some of the line so you don't snap the line. Uh, and you've got to slowly turn the momentum around and start pulling it in. And then it was put in gear and the retrieval process was commenced. Once on board the aircraft, it flew back to Hickam Air Force Base uh, where the film was removed. Now, here's the process that was required. Here's the, the satellite discoverer coming along, okay? The uh, canister is in the nose tip over here. It 
jets on the on the Discover would have it turn 120 degrees so that it was in like a backward trajectory position, and then it would eject the capsule. And at this point, there was uh, spin put into it, uh, and then there was a thrust cone separation, and then the shoot, uh, there was a recovery shoot that came out, then there was a main uh, a deceleration shoot that came out as it get in, got into heavier atmosphere, and there was a main shoot that finally came out around 55,000, 60,000 feet. And so then the plane would come along with this hook in the back and try to, try to grab the chute. But the capsule did have a heat shield as it was coming down before the chutes popped out. Uh, wow, and the, that's amazing. Yeah, so the so heat shield technology was there way before the, uh, uh, the Mercury. Well, actually, the Mercury program was developed in the 1960s also. So they were developing this heat shield technology for both the manned programs and the unmanned canister satellite programs. Is this a common happening? A common what? Common happening. Do they do this quite often? Yeah. Not, any, not, not anymore. No more. It's back in the 60s. Not anymore. The, the, only, the only reason they did this was because they didn't have sophisticated electronics to send it, to digitize the pictures and send them back through radio. So the, they had to use the film. film. Basically the same cameras they used in the U2s. They U2 had to retrieve the film. And yes. they had to retrieve it. Right. The same similar camera systems in the U2, they now put in orbit. Okay. So it took pictures. Then how do you get the how do you get the film back? Well, you've got to drop it somehow. And so it was in a canister with a heat shield, which was eventually slowed down by a parachute. A parachute would eject, and then you know the plane would come along, and it would you know, it would snag the the lines of the parachute and and kept, yeah, but kept figuring all this out. That's a, that was something. And that's why they developed well, computers. Yeah. Yeah. That's why they had ENIAC and all those other pro you know all of these things all kind of integrated together. It was amazing how the technology developed just at the right time, you know, transistors, the computer, uh, missiles, uh, the, the, whole, the whole thing, photography. It was all driven so that you could get to missions like this. So now here, here's, here's kind of a schematic, which is a little easier to see. The satellite would be coming with a trajectory around the Earth like this. There would be a separation point where it separated and eventually came down, and the planes would, would, the plane would catch it. Now the whole thing is you could improve your catch uh, probability by having more planes in the air, obviously. Oh. Okay. So it just yeah. wasn't one wasn't plane. just wasn't one plane oh, that they. Wow. Yeah. That exactly. I'm sure maybe they tried one plane first and they realized, well, maybe if we missed had a few it. more. Yeah, missed it. <laughs> <laughs> Why not just dump the thing in the ocean and let it float with a beacon well, they, they, and? Uh, they well, into that. Well, they so ball. They were yeah, I mean that's the problem. You got to make it. You got to make it lighter than uh, density has to be less than water. Um, Understood. Right and. They stopped the, mis the film canister retrieval program um, after the Russians started having their submarines stationed out in uh, Hawaii <laughs> in the retrieval get, area. They right, because these things would sink and you know, the Russians would try to catch it. So, <laughs> so there were a lot, of, you know, a lot of reasons why they just wanted to dump it in the ocean. But here it shows like they would typically have four or five planes along the trajectory that they expected the satellite to come down. But you know, you can think it's going to be, how do you space these out? Uh, because wind carries things this way, that way, faster, slower. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, you've got to have planes all over the place. How do you, you know, how do you fuel them out in the middle of the ocean? Uh, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's amazing technology for the time, it really was. How many planes did they typically put out? They said four. Four. Yeah, yeah, four. So, you know, and and then one, one of the guys was lucky. Yeah. All right, so here's the planes. Here's one. Here's a the C-119 recovering Discover 14. This was the first successful missile, uh, first successful canister catch. And you can see there's, yeah, there's, uh, it's, the hook is going to grab the lines in the parachute. The parachute's going to go right through the, these are like two metal bars, and then there's, I think, a nylon loop. There's a nylon loop here. And so that's going to, that's going to snag it. And it's going to allow the nylon to play out because they don't want to snap anything. You know, there's a lot of momentum when that when that when it hits the, uh, the parachute. Then eventually you reel it back in again. Now here's another one. This is uh, this is the, the JC-130 recovering this. I don't understand what this is on the top of this parachute here, uh, but again you can see the two the two uh, metal uh, leaders coming out and some kind of nylon or something in between that's going to snag the the parachute above as opposed to, you know, on the lines. Where did you get all these pictures? Off the internet. You stole really? Them. Yeah, they're off the internet. Yeah, this is all declassified. Yeah. 
it's off the internet. Uh, okay, so here we're going to have, this is a, uh, an eight minute video called the Corona Project Overview. It was made in 1995 when, uh, when Discover was uh, declassified. It was done by the National Reconnaissance Office, uh, which became, which was uh, developed by, uh, which was created under John F. Kennedy, I think in 61, combination of, of an arm of the CIA and an arm of the Department of Defense in the National Reconnaissance Office. And we're gonna see, hear an explanation from them from 1995. It shows Ms. Schmitta Airfield in what was then the Soviet Arctic. The photo was taken on August 18, 1960. That's the airstrip right there. camera mounted on a they satellite. Never, they never knew there was an airstrip there before. By today's imagery standards, the photo looks fuzzy and distant. Yet it was a great value because it was the first. One of many firsts for the Corona Satellite Reconnaissance Program. So now there's an ocean recovery there. Yeah, yeah. Corona began under utmost secrecy. The Air Force, specifically its Ballistic Missile Division, will be responsible for the development, launch, and operation of the spaceborne vehicle as well as recovery of the payload. There's a payload there. The Central Intelligence Agency will be responsible for developing and procuring reconnaissance equipment and selecting the targets for imaging. Uh, the Corona program was envisioned to be a series of satellites that would carry cameras to photograph denied areas. into polar orbits by four boosters. The spacecraft will fly at approximate altitudes of 100 nautical miles and take pictures of selected target areas. See them maneuvering in space? Yeah. The exposed film returned to Earth in capsules ejected from the satellite will be snatched in mid-air over the Pacific Ocean and airlifted to processing facilities. Contractors would play leading roles like in turning a plans into reality. That's a prayer. Corporation yeah. would design the spaceborne camera. Lockheed Missiles and Space Corporation would develop the upper stage and serve as integrator for the entire effort. General Electric would design and manufacture the recovery capsule. And Eastman Kodak would furnish a new film designed to operate in the unique environment of space. By May 1960, the Corona program was well underway. There had been 11 launches, none of which had achieved mission success. Then, an incident occurred that added urgency to the mission. The shoot-down of a U-2 flight over the USSR on the 1st of May. With aerial photography now denied the nation, Gary the United States urgently needed an alternative. And Corona became that alternative. When the program began as an interim, short-term, high-risk effort, it far exceeded early expectations and answer. would deliver, as history attests, better quality and more plentiful photo reconnaissance than the U-2. Corona was not an instant success. The first 12 launches were failures for various reasons. The causes were multiple and ranged from launch vehicle misfire on the pad to failure to achieve orbit. And there were instances when, having achieved orbit, the satellite actually entered an incorrect orbit. There were improper capsule ejections. Improper and capsule failures. ejections, those were the UFOs in Pennsylvania. Perseverance <laughs> paid off. With the success of the 13th launch, publicly announced as Discovery 13 on August 12, 1960. This flight designed to test the recovery vehicle had no camera on board. So much I just had a dummy wait where the camera The vehicle was successfully launched, orbited, and deorbited. Makes sense, why waste the camera? So you've developed your technique of snatching in midair. The only hitch was with the capsule splashdown well away from the planned impact point. 
Unfortunately, a recovery helicopter reached it in time before it sank. While less than perfect, it was another first for mankind. The recovery of a vehicle from space. One week after the Discoverer 13 water recovery, Discoverer 14 achieved full success. The vehicle carried a 20-pound load of film. The camera worked perfectly, and a full load of film was exposed and transferred to the recovery capsule. Ejected on the satellite's 17th fence, the film capsule was successfully snatched in mid-air by an Air Force C-119 aircraft. Just 110 days after the U-2 incident, Corona had made a quantum leap in intelligence gathering by operating from the new high ground of space. 3,000 feet of film were acquired on Discover 14's historic flight. More than 1,650,000 square miles of Soviet territory had been photographed for interpretation, providing more coverage than all of the U-2 missions over the Soviet Union throughout previous years. That's why it had a polar orbit. Data like this helped build confidence in the measures taken by our national leaders to counter the growing Soviet threat. Constant technical improvement was a hallmark of the Corona program. Industries, designers, and engineers were continually challenged to improve the program's capabilities. Early missions used acetate-based film, which crumbled and jammed repeatedly in spaceborne cameras. To solve the problem, Eastman Kodak developed the capability to coat a high-resolution emulsion onto a polyester base. This new polyester-based film could withstand the vacuum condition of space. And in later improvements, it was made thinner, permitting the spacecraft to carry more film, thus increasing mission duration. 145th and final Corona launch took place on May 25th, 1972. Having achieved its purpose, Corona's existence is now unclassified, and its artifacts have been made available to the Smithsonian Institution so that others might gain a sense of how far-reaching the program's unsung heroes were in their pioneering efforts. The camera and two buckets from Corona's last flight will be part of a permanent exhibit at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Team members who made up the Corona program can take just pride for their achievements in intelligence gathering, as well as their scientific and technical contributions. They have compiled an enviable number of lasting firsts. The first use of a satellite to gather photo intelligence. The first mid-air recovery or catch of a re-entry vehicle. The first mapping of the Earth from space. The first gathering of stereo optical data from space. The first use of multiple re-entry vehicles. The first space reconnaissance program to fly 100 missions. Corona was the prototype for follow-on photo reconnaissance programs, an unmanned spaceflight endeavor that provided leading-edge technology to future manned spaceflight. As the program resulted in scientific and technical achievements, Corona also served as the model for a new organization, the National Reconnaissance Office, bringing together the best talents of the CIA and the DOD with design build and operate Corona's successors. Okay. Good. Good. Here's a quick look. We're almost done. Got about three more slides. Here's a quick look of the whole uh, U.S. satellite reconnaissance systems program up until about the 90s. Um, this is the Corona system over here. I'll show you a, uh, it's hard to see. There you go. This is, uh, this is the Corona project in through here, which eventually after 72 became uh, Argon, Lanyard, then Gambit, okay, those are the code names for them. Um, the different cameras, this was a KH-1, KH-2, KH-3, KH-4, as the, as the cameras were developed and became more sophisticated, and I guess as payloads became easier to put into space, they developed more sophisticated cameras. Um, and so these are called keyhole cameras, K-U-I-H-O-L-E. That's why we got the K-H designation. And that's basically it mm -hmm. for the... Bob, got a question. Do you think it's possible here on the ground right here to see a satellite? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I swear I saw one last year. 
Okay. And everybody says I was crazy. No, you can. You know, good eyes then. For, for maybe thirty seconds. Well, that might have been a meteor. Okay. No, it was. It was. It looked like a. It looked like just a blob in the sky. Well, it's possible. There's also ball lightning, or there are fireballs that, that, that come through the atmosphere. If you saw it, it would be a dot. A little tiny, 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 tiny dot. It would look like a star, but because it's very bright, you know, you can't see any depth, you can't see any um, size to it. It looks like a very bright star, and you can see it moving quickly, it, moving quickly, but in the same circular path. And the thing is, it'll last from horizon to horizon. Usually a meteor at some point will burn out. You know, we'll see it enter the atmosphere, it'll flare up, and then it'll, it'll disappear. Good job, Toby. I'll see you next month. Okay, sounds good. So satellites don't flare at all. They just appear as little white dots that are, are going across the... Uh, and they're 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 out out they care. Okay. Um, the ones you see are probably in low Earth orbit, like 190 miles, 280 miles above the Earth. Okay, you can't see the geosynchronous satellites. They're 22,000 miles away. Okay, they're too far. But the one you're seeing are the ones that are in low Earth orbit. Uh, Tom's got a question. Right. No, okay. Right field. Okay. Right field. Patterson. Yeah. I'm talking. To